Hi, Philip. How are you? Thank you hey. for uh, this interview. Hey, no, it's good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Can you please uh, introduce yourself for uh, our audience and then I will start with a few questions. Sure. So I'm Philip Gradwell and I'm the chief economist at Chainalysis. And Chainalysis is the blockchain analysis company. So we look at data on the blockchain to try and understand what's going on when we use that data to help uh, for compliance and for law enforcement against illicit activity. And as the chief economist, my job is actually to look at our data set as a whole to see if I can understand what's going on in cryptocurrency markets. And chain analysis has become very famous for uh, investigating uh, into the um, MT Gox hack. So, um, how was your journey evolved uh, from that investigation? Right. Yeah, so chain analysis really got going with the MT Gox hack. So, Michael, our CEO at the time, he was actually working at Kraken, and the hack of MT Gox was you know, really serious. The industry thought it almost could be the end of Bitcoin. So a lot of people across the industry pitched in to help. And Michael realized that actually we would be able to track the flow of Bitcoin on the blockchain to see where it had gone. And that was really the birth of Chainalysis. And since then, you know, that was back in 2014. So it's been wow, six years now. We've built out certainly our product for um, investigations, uh, which we call Reactor. Uh, and that's now used you know, very widely around the world. And then we've also added new products, uh, one called Know Your Transaction, or KYT, which is used by exchanges to run their anti-money laundering. Uh, so yeah, it's been you know, a big journey of growth, actually, and, and working out that product market fit and understanding how we can use on-chain data in different ways. And there are more and more scams nowadays. How is the illicit cryptocurrency sector evolving? Yeah, so while it's always been actually growing in absolute terms in recent years, its share of overall blockchain activity has been decreasing. Uh, so actually it's you know, now around 1% of all the transactions on the blockchain are related to illicit activity. But certainly the mix of activity has changed. So if you go back to 2013, you know, the Silk Road uh, was really a major a uh, source of traffic uh, on the blockchains where people were sending a lot of their Bitcoin. However, .NET markets you know, are now not the only type of illicit activity. Um, in fact, in last year, the largest source of illicit activity were Ponzi schemes. So for example, the plus token scams where people think they're gonna get some great returns by uh, sending Bitcoin to someone, uh, but people might actually pay some Bitcoin out to the early participants. But eventually, when the pot of invested Bitcoin gets big enough, people run off with the money. Uh, and so those scams have been really large in terms of dollar value in the last year. And also there's been, while perhaps not raising as much money, it's certainly become much more prevalent, is the use of cryptocurrency to fund ransomware campaigns. So that's where someone downloads some software into a computer, encrypts it, and will not unencrypt it unless you pay them a Bitcoin ransom. So doesn't make as much money as Ponzi schemes or .NET markets, uh, but definitely we've seen the number of those attacks increase uh, in recent months and years. And if everyone uh, started to use uh, privacy coins, um, how would you think your business can evolve? Yeah, so I mean, I think Chainalysis is going to need to evolve as privacy coins evolve, and, and not even just privacy coins, but you know, improvements to privacy in Bitcoin and more more commonly used cryptocurrencies. Like I think that is actually necessary for cryptocurrencies evolution. But if everyone went over to privacy coins, you know, there's obviously less that you can see. Um, so we'd have to evolve our technology to see if we can do that. And I think there would be some things that we wouldn't be able to see. Um, it's probably an okay thing. You know, Bitcoin is probably too transparent at the moment for widespread adoption. And I think the other thing is, even if we had a totally private option, I do think people would actually still want to use coins where they were able to see some information. I think the world in which you know, we're all transacting and we have no idea who we're interacting with is actually a world where people find it difficult to you know, trust the businesses, for example, uh, or indeed get a sense of you know, what's the market dynamics and how much is this asset worth. So I don't think we'll move to a world that's completely private. 
I always think there'll be some information and therefore some analytics that can be done. And what do you think about the measures that the G20 are, um, are, are putting in, uh, in, um, in life? How, how will it impact stable coins market? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of work in, again, recent months and years to coordinate global anti-money laundering and know your customer uh, standards for cryptocurrency. So previously there've been a lot of national approaches and then the G20 in particular through the Financial Action Task Force is trying to um, get a coordinated approach by saying, look, these are the requirements we expect each country to meet. And there's been some good things in that, some difficult things in that. Uh, in particular, there's the travel rule, uh, which means for transfers over a certain dollar value, say from an exchange or what they call a virtual asset service provider, um, they need to pass on the information of the person uh, that is sending it and they need to know uh, who is receiving it. And that's quite complicated to um, implement in you know, cryptocurrency. And I think the industry is really working out how to try and do that. And actually, I think this week, the deadlines for that were pushed back because it's been difficult. I think, I mean, at the time, Chainalysis actually came out and said, look, we think this is putting too much personally identifiable information, you know, sort of into the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Um, I think for me, it's one of these challenges. The way that regulators are looking at the problem is by applying you know, traditional fiat regulations to cryptocurrency, but there might be more alternative creative ways. Um, you know, for example, we found because you have the complete record of transactions on the blockchain, that you can actually do more sophisticated AML than you can in the fiat world, where your bank can only see transactions you know, that happen within their system. So at the moment, you know, it's actually still an open area of discussion and development, even though these rules have been you know, developed. I do think it's good to have that international coordination, um, but you know, as ever, the devil's in the detail and they're proving hard to work out. In terms of the impact on stable coins, so for me, stable coins are interesting. Um, you know, Tether is the most popular stable coin by far. And I think a key reason why it's been popular is because it allows people access to US dollars while not being under the jurisdiction of you know, the underlying asset um, you know, for many good reasons and some bad reasons. So there's clearly a demand there uh, for, you know, having an asset outside of its normal realm of jurisdiction um, and therefore things like that have potentially work against that at the same time we've seen increasing popularity in the more regulated stable coins such as usdc uh, so you know i actually don't think that's necessarily going to be driven by the regulation i think it's actually about who where's the greater demand you know is it for something that's actually plugged in, say, to the US financial system, or something that's plugged in to non-US financial systems. And uh, where do you see cryptocurrencies in five or 10 years? Will, uh, will they be a payment method or a more store of value? Will they reach uh, mass adoption for you? Yeah, so, I mean, honestly, yeah, we're obviously broadcasting this at sort of time of coronavirus, so thinking a year ahead is hard at the moment. Um, maybe five to 10 years is easier actually. So I think for me, the big signposts almost for where cryptocurrencies might get to are, you know, we do, like I expect there to be more mainstream um, interest, say in Bitcoin as an investment opportunity. You know, it's potentially proving itself at the moment as you know, an interesting asset class that is exposed to you know, global trends rather than national trends, uh, that is you know, digital first in a world where there's perhaps less physical interaction. So it becomes a really interesting asset class for people. And we're starting to see you know, that professional interest come into place. So in five years time, I'd expect you know, Bitcoin to be part of investment uh, portfolios. And that's definitely treating it as a store of value. But Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency. And there, I think the area of most exciting innovation in terms of cryptocurrencies as a means of payment 
are going to be around what I call the social coins. So you've got Libra, but you've also got things like clay, but cacao and uh, South Korea are trying out. And you know, I think we're going to see more of efforts by social networks to see if they can introduce a payment token. And for me, the big discussion is, well, is that type of digital money, you know, how does that sit alongside uh, more perhaps pure cryptocurrency types of um, means of payment, such as DAI or Tether? Um, and then on the other side, how does it match things like central bank digital currencies? So that's essentially government saying, look, we're going to remove the crypto part of it, but we're going to issue our own digital money. And really where cryptocurrency ends up in five to 10 years is going to depend about the competition between this kind of pure cryptocurrency means of payment, um, ones pushed by social networks and ones pushed by governments. Okay. Thank you, Philip, for uh, this interview. Uh, looking forward to talk with you later this year. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.